All right, hi everyone. This is Yaren Kim. Um, I am so excited to introduce you and share all this amazing expertise and knowledge by our first presenter of the season. We're in a definitely unusual um, and in a way challenging times. Everything is online. And so we decided as a group for the South Bend Area Music Teachers Association to bring all our guest presenters um, and workshop to online. So to kick it off, uh, we have Dr. Nessa Gig 50. She is joining us from Miami, Florida. And I'm actually connecting in Bellevue, Washington for teachers and audiences in Indiana. So what an amazing situation actually. Um, I think it's actually been quite wonderful that we're able to still connect, uh, make meaningful events, projects, music, sharing knowledge um, with people across the country and also across the world. So we're really lucky to have um, this amazing person with me today. She's one of the most energetic and exciting pianists I know. I've, I've known Inessa, uh, I, get, I don't even know how many years ago. We met in 2012? Yeah. Something like that. Time is so warped these days, especially with the pandemic. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll hand it over to her, but just to give you a little bit of background, um, she's a fantastic pianist. She's an amazing, she shows a lot of energy and leadership. Um, she's one of the co-founders and the president of Kaleidoscope Muse. And here, I will read a little bit about that organization because I think it's quite inspiring. Um, you will have a link to her, her bios and more detailed stuff in, in the link below. But let's see. So what she does with the organization is the organization dedicated to bringing the gap between canonical classical music and rarely heard or recently composed works while prominently featuring living composers and emerging artists. Um, that's pretty amazing because, you know, we're always challenged to keep the music going of new composers while obviously appreciating and studying the great works um, that's, that's behind us. So what she does is kind of bridging the past and the present and making future for students, performers, and educators. Um, so yeah, we're excited to talk to her. And today the topic that she's gonna be talking mainly about is very relevant to our situation. You know, back in March, the whole world went online, basically. And so for musicians, that was another different level of challenge that we had to figure out. You know, how do you teach online? How do you deal with this softwares that we've had access to before, but n none of us really had to use it as much because we didn't need to. So we had to kind of learn it so quickly. Um, and then also to figure out how to engage a student how, for performers, how to perform at home. There's just been series of challenges, but on the other side, there's been amazing projects that came out from it. Um, the things that we've never seen before. A lot of people who, who did new things and came out beautifully. Um, for instance, one of the things, I never thought I would be doing an online chamber music festival. And it was just something that I did it out of being desperate. I thought, oh my goodness, we have to do something about this. So we did it and it was a blast, you know? So that's sort of the topics that I think we'll talk mostly on with, with Dr. Gagrifti today. Um, how to keep the motivation and creativity going during this unusual time and hopefully it will end, but the skill sets that we're all developing now won't. So I think this is actually, in a different way, a good opportunity to expand our knowledge, expand our, our skill sets and musicianship that we can actually use and develop during this time. So I'll, enough talking from me. Um, you, would, you, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit and then we can start? Sure, thank you so much, Yerin. Um First of all, thank you for having me uh, to everyone. And it's a pleasure to connect even though in this new virtual way, and not in person. Um, and yes, all the things you said stand true, and I think I should just not talk anymore because you covered it. <laughs> uh, 
um, I think everything was uh, is spot on. It's very much uh, a challenging time, but also it's a time that has um, perpetuated more creativity. Perhaps because of that, because we have that challenge, then uh, the boundaries start to be pushed further and further in order to um, come up with solutions. So, um, as far as me, business, I get free. I am originally from Albania, and I've been in the States from 2008. 2008. Um, I've had the fortune to actually, you know, meet colleagues and friends who later become also colleagues, like Yerin here and everybody else that I've met at Indiana University. Prior to that, I was at Boston Conservatory. Also had the, the fortune to meet great people and to study with wonderful teachers. Um, and in 2017, graduated from University of Miami, where I'm at now, actually. I'm in the studio of Professor Santiago Rodriguez, who has gracefully allowed me to, to use it for this semester. So um, during all of these uh, studies and, I guess, travels and learning experiences, I think one of the main um, things that I remember from everyone is to always push yourself, whether it's professionally, whether it's uh, in the way you think about music, about life, about society, anything. So to have that kind of, um, I guess, bird's eye view of, of topics in general, it really helps and it makes one feel a little bit more motivated, even when things right now at the same, at this particular time, uh, may feel a little bit difficult. So um, about Kaleidoscope Music Art, thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, that has been the, the child of many of us, actually. So interestingly enough, all uh, four out of the five co-founders of the organization are Indiana University alumni. Um, my husband, Redi Lupa, included, uh, who studied with Professor uh, Fressler at IU, um, Maria Sumareva, who also studied with Professor Fressler, and Akina Yura, who studied with Professor Auer at uh, Indiana University. And it so happened that all of us were here at the University of Miami as well, met composer Rodrigo Busad, and then it all kind of came together uh, in November of 2015. And since then, we have been presenting uh, concerts. Like Yerin mentioned, that uh, bridge this, um, you know, invisible gap between uh, music that is well-known, well-performed as well, and music that is uh, rarely heard from those same composers, perhaps, that we are so accustomed to listening to, um, and to music that is recently created. Um, every year we have these two special projects that are um, very dear to our heart that are beyond the regular concert series that we do. One of them is the Call for Scores, and that's how we try to instigate more creativity from young composers and not young composers, anybody. <laughs> and um, the Young Talent Showcase, which is something that I think connected us first um, in, in, with regard to this topic, actually, with Yerin. Um, once things started going online, one of the things that we started talking about with regard to youth and how to keep them motivated was what can we do so that teachers who perhaps are feeling a little bit uh, less inclined to uh, push students towards a performance. And then on the other flip side, students who don't have those uh, spring recitals to look forward to and maybe some of the assessments that they normally do are not taking place or they're taking place online. Um, how can we then Keep this kind of excitement going and of course there's so many organizations and so many people that are doing things online and um, that started doing that for us it was in the format of motivation monday so we figured what better way to start the week than to show these young kids that are sharing their their talent and their hard work so that is still going on and we're, we will keep doing it until there's people who would like to share things with us um this past and, week and maybe. that's something anybody any teachers could submit right Absolutely, yes. So I'll, send, I'll also include the link to the Motivation Monday. So, you know, if teachers have any students that would like to be showcased, they can, they can submit it to that address. I think there's a website for that too, right? Yes, there is one, yes. That has all the information as well as the email address. And I've included that in the PowerPoints that I'll share with you mm -hmm. um, so you can have easy access to that as well. Awesome. Uh, uh, Dr. Gegrifti prepared an amazing looking... I feel like this color represents you. <laughs> when I think of you, I'm, it's like lines and red and energy. So this is, this is pretty awesome. Okay, I'll let you talk. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, I guess I color coordinated without thinking today. <laughs> it happened very strangely. Um, so 
the, the whole idea of the, the topic, it's not quite a topic, it's more of a, a, you know, open table discussion of sorts. And I wish we were able to do this in person so we could all uh, brainstorm ideas. But um, very often throughout this entire time, I kept thinking, um, whether in the middle of a lesson or after a lesson, what am I doing? <laughs> and not just, um, you know, in terms of how am I instructing the students and whether it's going well or not, but even just the effect that certain things had on me. And I know it's very easy to say, let it go. And it's much harder to do. Um, in, in, in Albania, the country that I'm from, we have this saying that goes, uh, saying from doing, there's a huge mountain between the two. So again, it's very easy to say, be patient, be creative, but it's very difficult to do. So whatever it is that I'm saying, take it with a grain of salt and just find your own way of getting around it. Because I think it's a lot of trial and error for everyone. And uh, what works for one doesn't work for somebody else. It's not one size fits all. Um, and it's definitely been very challenging. I think especially for, I want to say all music teachers, but maybe I sympathize more with piano teachers. <laughs> because also the the issues that we may have due to the configuration of our instrument and the fact that it's not mobile like some other instruments may be that uh, make even the visual aspect of, of teaching remotely a little bit easier. Um, so with that idea in mind, I want to just go straight to the point right away. Let's vent about how bad this has been. <laughs> because I think if we get all the negative stuff out first, then we can focus on what is good and what can we make better if um, is already good and what can That's we really smart. yes we have lots to vent <laughs> that's another thing i've been doing zoom um not zoom mostly facetime and skype lessons before the pandemic because i have some students in korea and when i moved from new york um there are some students that i still teach uh, uh taught so then it wasn't totally new but then something about maybe it's psychological something about like we only have to teach online was a such a like a pressure to both parties right and then it comes to like oh then do we ever get to perform or you know there's that extra all these extra not only just the lesson part it's the extra psychological and emotional like pressure that we have as teachers and students to feel like oh this is awful you know um, so that was my, one of the most challenging things um, kind of trying to keep positive. I don't know what our challenge was, like the biggest one, but that was yes, my Yes, I, I think a big part of it is the fact that it feels as though uh, there is no other option, right? So whatever it is that we are doing with this kind of remote technology has to be the best because that is the only method of instruction. So it's not like you are uh, relying on it as a secondary aid or as a middle of the week check in kind of uh, short lesson or something like that. This is really the only way you are able to reach uh, the students. So I absolutely agree with you that level of pressure is, is huge because also as the teacher, then you are expected to know what you're doing regardless of the fact whether you do or not and whether this is new or not. Uh, if you have all the, the devices at home or you have to go quickly purchase them and do some research. So there are so many layers to it that I think made the whole process much harder, especially as a, a, an initial shift. Um, for me, a big part of it was just the fact that I was in front of the screen for so long. And already we are in front of the screen, you know, writing, emails, all the other things that you need to do. Uh, and that kind of contact and that kind of connection that you have with somebody in real time, real life, in person, um, it can never really be substituted. There's ways to enhance the whole uh, remote experience, but of course the, the, you know, the personal connection is very difficult to, to keep up with. And I mean, we know this, if you talk to somebody on the phone and suddenly they're, you know, telling you something, you may think of it as, oh, they're being sarcastic or they're being mean. It's just because you do not see their actual full reaction. So um, it, some of that's translated into this experience too, I think the, the yeah. remote learning and teaching. That's one of the most like main complaints I've heard so far from both teachers and students that there's this lack of human connection that they don't feel like making music in this platform is is fulfilling um, but then I've also 
talk to those people afterwards after trying to do some stuff um, that it's something is better than nothing <laughs> is my theory you know anything yes. is better than nothing um, and, and for example my uh, teacher from New York he thinks the zoom talk is kind of drawn him closer to students because we do weekly checkups and um, so I think there's a way around it, but it's a little overwhelming if you don't know how to use it. So I think that's something that our teachers will be very happy to hear from this, this talk. Yes, for sure. It could be overwhelming and like anything else that is new, but I do agree with you. Yes, having this uh, has been, I don't know, like, you know, the best solution, I think, for the time that we, we have had to figure things out. and. I know that there's at the, the end, the, one of the links that I've included in the presentation, you, you'll have um, the PDF that then can take you to the other links, basically, as far as uh, microphones and all those other extra tools. But also one of the things that we recently received here at the University of Miami, actually, was from somebody at Yale that had worked with Zoom on creating the latest update that is music friendly. It's a high fidelity setting. I have not yet tried that. We just received it two days ago, so I included that in the document. Um, if anybody finds it useful and they want to, to test it out. Um, but of course, for because Zoom is not made really for music, right? So it condenses the tone and it does all those really strange things where if you're using pedal, it sounds like a marimba and maybe it goes in and out and it sounds like a steel pan. And if the piano is out of tune, then you're dealing with this whole other sp spectra of sound that you didn't even know existed for the instrument of the piano. So um, all of those challenges. So in my mind, I think the one of the biggest that I had to adapt myself to was actually the first one here, the physical distance in the sense that um, we are so accustomed sometimes to just, you know, take the hand of the student and show them what to do or put their shoulders down, straighten their back, you know, ask them to do certain things in a more direct physical way. and visual, physical cues can be understood and processed much faster than verbal ones. So then for the student, that is an immediate kind of connection. But on the flip side, though, I do think that if they're just seeing what you're doing and they're copying what you're doing, there are chances that they will not actually retain that sort of process of what it took to get there. So the whole idea of having to explain something, there's a positive to it because you're making them think through your process of thinking. So. It's the whole thing of they can't read your mind. So now you have to explain it really, really well uh, for them to understand, given that there's that added distance to the whole experience as well. That's a really good point that you bring up because I, I guess I never thought about it that way. But the fact that you're adding another layer of instruction, it's actually enhancing the whole learning process because it's not just, like you said, visual. It's not just, OK, just do it this way, physical but it's this combination of multi-sensory things that now both teachers and students have to process. And in a way that kind of cements what they're learning a little bit better. And it's not by chance. When they learn something, I feel like it wasn't, because sometimes when you, you play a lesson, give a lesson, you play and you think, oh, that was really good. And then you go home and you think, I don't know how I did that. You know, you hear that from your students all the time too. They're like, well, I played it, better in front of you, but I don't know how I did it. So in a way, this kind of physically distanced lesson where we're just making sure that they get it. I mean, it's exhausting for the teachers because you have to like give so much to make sure that they got it, but they get it, I think, because we, we are able to provide um, multiple diff like different angles to explaining one concept. So that's a really good point that what you yeah. said about it. Yes, and, and then you also have to add uh, tools to exp explain it, right? It could be visual aids as in writing things down or asking them to write it down. That way they really instill it into their system, right? It's the whole idea that if you write it down, you remember it better than if you just go, mm-hmm, I got it. <laughs> so that whole uh, process, I guess, is a little bit different. And I think when we're in person, because of that immediacy that we have in the, the lesson giving and lesson receiving process, there's that, uh, it's almost like a, a lack of patience because things happen more quickly and you react more quickly. Your feedback is more immediate. So then um, we tend to take shortcuts, not consciously, not in a, an ill-mannered way. It's just because, you know, music, <laughs> we get impassioned by things and then we want solution right away. 
but the whole distance learning i think has made all of that come to a, you know like a reevaluation of of sorts um and then to the second point which that was one of the things that started to frustrate me uh, the most being second <laughs> um, on the list. The idea that you can't control what's going on on the other side. And sometimes you can't control what goes on on your side too, but you have a little bit more control over that at least um, than what you do, what goes on beyond your screen. So, you know, I'm sure everybody has had birds chirping, dog barking, little siblings crying, uh, grandma yelling in the, the sides of the, the living room. Um, I don't know, moving the bench without realizing that they need to mute themselves so you hear this explosion of <laughs> on your headphones, all of that kind of stuff. So uh, that I think makes it challenging just because of that level of, okay, you know, I need to make sure that those things do not affect what's going to happen in the actual lesson, that they are just, you know, surroundings and they're not the important, they're not the core of what's going to go on in this lesson. Um, one of the things though that was, again, on the flip side, revealing to me was, now I know why that student never fixed their hand position, or now I know why their back keeps looking like a question mark. So things like that, because you see where they actually practice. So you notice if the keyboard is really high and if they have benches that are not appropriate, um, mind blowing, but they could be sitting on the bed and have their tiny keyboard of less than seven octaves on a desk of sorts, and playing from higher up above. So all sorts of things were discovered during these months. <laughs> and that I think really, you know, brought to light a lot of uh, issues that I kept, you know, knocking my head against the wall for and thinking, why is this not getting fixed? So now I know why. And all of that then helps, you know, then address it, then you communicate to the parent and, you know, hopefully then there's a, a, a way to fix it along the, the, the way. But that's, uh, that's amazing. I didn't even think about that part of like, seeing how they practice there's a visual evidence of how they've been working at home <laughs> i guess that's that's a really good point do you also for your students for your studio give like a guideline on what to do like how to mute how to place the microphone you know just so that it's some some kind of a unified guidance for the like uh, for the lessons i mean for example i mean there are things you can't control there's a construction going on next to me, so I really hope it's not too loud. But then inside, my kids are screaming. So this is like the best I can do in this situation. <laughs> but, you know, I think it also helps for the teachers and students if we know at least there are like making sure you're not connecting on a personal hot uh, Wi-Fi. You know, that's also. Uh, but those are things I think sometimes they just need to know because they just assume Internet's the same. You know, it's, it's easy to think, oh, if you're connected to Internet, it should be, the, uh, you know, fine. But I know there's like if you connect it to Ethernet, it's the best case scenario. But not everybody has access to that or like the because we have piano. So maybe piano is in a different room far away from the Internet cord. So do you have like recommendations that on that kind of stuff? Yes. So initially, because all of this started as a temporary solution, then none, none of those went out, right? It was more of a, a survival mode that started happening for everyone right away. So then a lot of it was, uh, let's try this. Uh, why don't you move a little bit further? Let's try that. Disconnect the other device. So a lot of this kind of uh, time wasting, you know, trials. Um, but now, especially with the students that are let's say more advanced where, you know, sound quality matters even more and they have more expansive and uh, denser repertoire where what you're hearing can easily get affected. Then yes, for all of those students, similar to the list that I've provided for you guys at the end of the presentation, there's, you know, microphone setup that would be helpful. Ethernet, like you said, makes a huge difference. I, I tried it for myself uh, and I always thought Wi-Fi at home was pretty good, but no way there was so many uh gaps sometimes so it made a huge difference actually to use ethernet and thankfully with technology yes there's um issues and there's challenges but also there's been so many advances that now so many tools and gadgets are at our disposal um so you know amazon has i think i got uh, a, an ethernet cable that is 100 feet tall long so that can very easily go through like a huge place and i mean I need to roll it two times or three times to get around the area that I need it. So for somebody that has a larger home 
or that the piano is really far from where the modem is, there's ways to still connect that. Um, always given that you have a computer. So my first suggestion to everyone was that they really need to try to be on a computer. But then we had occasions when, you know, their camera was not good and it was an old computer and all of those other things. So then we ended up, you know, staying on phones with some of those students. Um, but definitely, I think if they can have a clear list of, of things that they need to have, then of course the process becomes much smoother because you don't have to readjust every time. Then the setup is there, you come in, you start, you get to work. You don't have to, um, you know, wobble around the whole system issue, so. Does that kind of go into the next of technology is evil? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's also because um, until we figured out that there are certain settings on Zoom that make the sound better, even if you don't use any other additional tools to it, um, it was extremely challenging for me. I had a few students that were uh, more advanced from the younger group of, of uh, children that I teach. And, you know, he was playing uh, Live a Slide by Rahmaninov. And the first time that he played it for me in the lesson, I just honestly could not make out any of the things that he was playing because Zoom was condensing the sound and it was, you know, dimming certain uh, frequencies. And then whenever it would get too loud, it would then cut off completely because it thinks it's noise. And I think especially for piano, I don't know how the other instruments I, are dealing with this, but for piano, given that our range is so broad, and the frequencies are really much wider than uh, Zoom has more of a challenge with us too, as pianists. So the whole settings, uh, which again, I've included in the last document, um, the, with removing, well, disabling intermittent and uh, persistent background noises, that made a huge difference. And then um, not allowing the microphone to be automatically adjusting so that it does not do that. Um, all of those little things that, again, we learned along the way, but then, you know, there's tutorials nowadays that you can watch on YouTube. And uh, if you are part of an institution, then you're even more in luck because there's people that are actually working to make things better uh, in that institution. So we continuously get new information here about what works better and what microphone should you use, depending on what kind of um, activity you do. And then as far as the video, that was one of the things that was a little bit more concerning to me. That's why I found, you know, like these apps that connect to the phone and all of that. Um, if there's not enough room, for example, where the piano is, then, you know, the video is super low and they're putting it in such a place where you only see their head. <laughs> and you're like, you look nice. I like seeing your face, but I need to see your hands. <laughs> so <laughs> that kind of thing with, you know, tilt the, the computer and uh, move the iPad and this and that. So, um, you know, stands and having uh, an app on the phone that connects to the camera instead of your computer camera, all of those things, I think, you know, started again becoming part of the challenge. Right. I think if I'm correct, Zoom just did an update specifically for music. Is that right? Right. Yes. Yeah. That's the part that I have not tried yet. Uh, we just got notice of it two or three days ago, I think, here. Uh, so. Yeah, I'll have to try it out. My, my um, teaching doesn't start next week, but I'll definitely try it out. And that, that's another thing that's why this is so useful that you're going over with, with us today because a lot of times studio teachers, private studio teachers don't get the necessary information like how we would get from a bigger institution. Um, but it's usually those studio teachers that have a really big studio. You know, we have, I know teachers with really large studios that we have to, or they have to kind of adapt to this without much resources. So um, I think this is, was one of the things that I thought was really going to be helpful of, of just, just going over some, some of these things should mm -hmm. be really useful for them. Yeah, and we can look over the, the document also at the end uh, if it helps. And I can show you a little bit of the setup that I have here, which is not what my usual setup, setup would be for the, the private lessons since I would do those from home. But uh, just to give an idea of how the whole visual aspect can be helped. And I know for Zoom, I mean, if you're doing the, the free account, then it does not allow for more than two people at the same time. Uh, or no, I'm sorry, I think it's three and up to 40 minutes, something like that. Uh, and then it cuts off. So then there's that other added challenge. So that goes, somebody had a question about the angle, which I'll get to. Um, and, you know, there's ways to kind of 
circumvent that if, if it helps, basically. Um, so, yes, technology is evil. Yes, we can't control what happens on the other side and physical distance makes everything more challenging. But uh, I think we all want to think in terms of what can we then do, right? So what are the things that um, we want to think about and you know, try to improve on ourselves? Um, first of all, positive versus negative mindset. For me, um, the most important thing is not to allow these external um, happenings to affect the rest of your day. And again, easier said than done, absolutely. I found that for myself, what really helps is to have something where I feel like I have more control over. So whether it's, you know, one or two hours of your own practice in the morning that you know you can do and you know nobody else is going to bother you. It makes you feel a little bit more like I'm in charge of what I'm doing and I started the day the way that I wanted it. Um, or if it's anybody that is into physical exercise or reading or anything, whatever it is um, that makes you feel like, I got this. This is my day. No matter what happens around me, it's, a, it's going to be fine. It's not going to affect the way that I deal with the rest of it. Uh, one of the main reasons for that is because, um, according to a lot of uh, psychological studies, the negative mood or our negative thoughts, they really do disturb the way that we in interact with our environment. So they almost create this uh, like um, dark curtain, in a way, of our response and our perception of our surroundings, which makes, of course, then dealing with students in a even in person lesson, but let alone that, then you're dealing with all the other external aspects that we were just talking about when you're doing remote lessons, that makes that even harder. That way we can't really, um, our perception is skewed, right? Because we're not seeing it the way that it is. Everything else becomes heightened and there's more tension and there's uh, more judgment and there's less time to think about it. and uh, there's more issues up in your head and then it all starts getting very, very um, difficult to clarify and to, you know, skim through. So definitely, I think, trying your hardest not to allow those things to come between you and your, your time, because also the time you're giving the lesson is your time. You, you kind of choose what to do with it. Um, one of the things that we talked about earlier is the fact that since we can't really show things the way we do in person, then we need to really over explain. Now that takes a lot of, and a lot of energy and a lot of thinking also, because the way you explain it to one student, you think that's the ultimate way to explain something. It's not going to work for somebody else. And we know this because everybody's different. So of course I'm not saying anything new, but it's just the fact that you then have to think on your feet and you have to adapt very quickly. All of those things, the ability to quickly adapt, again, needs a clearer mind. Um, and thinking about the fact that you have to plan accordingly also and plan beforehand, that also needs a clearer mind and more time. So um, I understand the struggle and it's, it's really difficult for everyone. But I do think that, again, like we said earlier, all of this has made us really think past our comfort zone. And I think in many ways, everyone, even those that are still, you know, struggling with Zoom or any other way that they're teaching, you have become better because of that. And you've become a better teacher and a better communicator because of all of this. So keep this up. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> um, one of the main things um, that I think is important, and not always do I get to do it, actually, because it depends on the, the family, depends on the time of the lesson, is to connect with the students and uh, with the student's family. So, you know, for them to know what they're doing for the rest of the week. Um, I know it seems silly to bring that up because when we're doing in-person lessons, the parent brings them. You talk to the parent, you tell them at the end of the lesson how it went, what they should be doing. In this case, it's okay, bye, end meeting, and that's it. So <laughs> making sure that there's still like a two-minute moment or five, whatever is needed to uh, talk to the parent. And sometimes it's worth cutting a lesson a little shorter and doing that rather than going all the way to the very last second and then, you know, having your next student waiting right after that. Um, That's so true because, you know, it's just at a click of a button these days. You know, <laughs> you can mute and unmute, end the meeting and you're, you're done. So I think, I mean, and, and our students too, if you're teaching um, pre-college students mainly, they're online all day from school. And a lot of times parents are on kind of online too with them monitoring. So a lot of times you might have parents who are like, okay, at least lessons, they can kind of do it on their own. 
and then they're not really there. You know, it's a time to go cook. I totally get it because I I'm like that too. You know, what my daughter, she's only five, <laughs> so her lessons aren't very long, but she takes cello lessons, half an hour, and that's the time I kind of leave it to my husband, and I'm off doing something else. But that's a good point. I think. If you can kind of communicate with the parents before saying like just two or three minutes after or before, just to go over, I feel like that goes a long way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, it certainly does. And I think it also kind of reassures you that the student will then be a little bit more responsible or held responsible for what they need to accomplish during the week. So um, that I think makes a difference for sure. Um, the last point here, actually, it's a little bit in line with uh, answering one of the questions that uh, you all had submitted. So I'm going to go on to the next slide so we can look at those questions. <clears throat> so the first one is, as I try to demonstrate a particular passage to the student, the camera view from one end of the keyboard does not seem to show them enough of what they need to see. I try to hold my camera phone above the keyboard. Uh, then I can only show them with one hand at a time. Yes. <laughs> Are there any good devices for mounting a camera up on the keyboard um, such that one can easily switch to that alternate camera during an e-lesson? So um, what I've uh, set up here actually is, I'm going to turn my camera really quickly before uh, by being very careful so I don't completely undo things. There's this up right here, the ring light. I have it with a ring light, but you don't have to, uh, because I use that for other things too. That's a that's a stand that is actually quite pliable, and it allows you to move the little place where the phone is held very easily, and it can bend a lot. And the same thing with a ring light, you can basically just move it about, what is that, 90 degrees? Um, so that's one of the gadgets that I'm using. And one of the reasons for that actually is because like I said earlier, if you have an account where you can't have, you know, more than three sources, and let's say if you want to share your music also in one of them, maybe you have an iPad that you are trying to annotate at the same time so the student can follow along, depending on how far along their study they are also, um, then you probably want to switch, like the question is uh, pointing out, you want to switch between camera angles. So what I normally do is um, again, in the list of resources, you have it there. There's an app called Epoch Cam, uh, which is completely worth it because um, what it does is that it then acts as your webcam, even though you're using your computer. So you can then place that on whatever kind of stand, um, have it on the piano, you can have it on the side, you can have it here. So that it makes a huge difference basically on what it is that you can show. And you can switch between that and your regular uh, webcam at any point during the lesson. That is uh, connected either via USB or Wi-Fi. I would suggest USB so that you don't take up Wi-Fi space and bandwidth. So it doesn't make things harder um, for the connection, but it really, yes. So does it mean that you don't have to log in Twice, right it's like already connected to your zoom account yes. um, and then you can using that app after you download it onto your device you can switch back and forth exactly yes so uh, in the document with the resources I included the link that takes you to the actual web page of the app so then it gives you the option to download for Android or uh, iOS and then once you have that downloaded on your computer you have them the drive also downloaded um, then that connects automatically. Um, and maybe at the end, we can do a little switching of the cameras so you can see what it does. But I think I have to be stop sharing my, my screen in order to do that. So maybe we can just do it at the end. Okay, that's really, that's really great. And then the device that you have, the ring light and the, the phone, you can easily get it on like Amazon, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. What do so, you search for? Like just phone stand? Sorry, say it again. Is it like a, just a, you could type in phone stand for the stand part? Yeah, so this is a ring light phone stand. So oh, it's attached. It comes yeah, together. Yeah, it's two in one. So actually, like I can turn off the ring, see? So it mm -hmm. has a bendy parts to it. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really cool. Then you can also move this. Oh, I see. However high or low you want it to. Yeah. It gives you a lot of flexibility, actually. And there's so many types of versions of this uh -huh. online. Um, basically, you have your pick. There's so many um, 
types that would be useful. And their prices really vary. You can go for something that is less indulgent, like about 20 bucks or anything mm. else that is more than that, if you want something super sturdy and with more possibilities. I do have to note that when you have that ring light on, it like visually, it's a lot cl more clear. You, do, you would think it doesn't matter too much, but you know, when you turned it on, do you have it on right now? Yes, now I do. Yeah. Yeah, when you turned it off for a second to show us, you can see the difference a little bit. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> I think the ring light got excited. <laughs> like me? Join the conversation. <laughs> it, yeah, it makes a difference, I think. So that's a really good resource. Yeah, I could see it. I might get one too. I've been looking into it. I didn't know there was one that's connected with the phone and the ring. So. Yeah, and actually, I don't have the other part of it, but it also has a... Um, phone holder that is like a clip on so you can clip it on anything that is like a stand so let's say okay. if you had another device that you wanted to add on to the mix then you can still do that or you can just place it wherever your regular uh, phone awesome one of them. yeah there's a lot of uh interesting things and you know i would have never thought of this um but i was looking for phone stands and then this popped up i guess because it's so popular for for people that make uh, like vlogs and youtube this that which i'm not influencers really familiar much but wait, so <laughs> since it's popular then it's a good thing it popped up right away so. oh, we piano teachers are all becoming influencers youtubers you know <laughs> I don't know if our following can match anything else that other people. <laughs> yeah, very different. You never know. Um, this could be the next thing, you know. Maybe, maybe, yes. <laughs> I guess if we find the funny thing to do, or like if this really hit me, then it would become a meme. Then we would be famous, you know. <laughs> That's the way things go now. <laughs> but you know, for the light though, it's interesting because at least I like to practice with really dim lights. So we don't really have any bright lights in the, at home in our studio where Eddie and I teach. So then everything is basically, you know, darker tone. Uh, so then when sometimes it's, I don't know, dark outside and dark inside <laughs> and people still can't see you. So it just helps. The first question was from Jerry Sutzman and I'm sure she'll be really happy to hear the, the suggestions and the devices that you just shared with us. Great. Maybe I'll also link a um, couple of things from Amazon that she can go directly to. So, so you, you actually have those in the PDF. Oh, amazing. You're way ahead of me. Yeah. Great. <laughs> and for the, the microphones and all of that, you have a few options going from, you know, something that is super economical all the way to fancy stuff, depending on okay. what people want to have. Perfect. So we're looking now at the second question. Um, how does she deal with poor connections? I am using lots of videos. Does she have other ideas? Um, like we said earlier, having an ethernet cable really makes a huge difference. And um, the sad thing though, is that it's not enough for the teacher to have that. The student needs to have that too, to uh, make to reassure that that connection actually is improved on both sides. Um, as far as videos goes, I actually do the same thing too. And even if it's not um, necessary to do that, if the connection was just fine, that's one of the things that I started adopting more and more with the um, online lessons. Um, I found that sometimes it was nice to have these check-ins with students during the, the week, if they had a weekend lesson, let's say, so mid-week, depending on where their lessons were, um, to just say, send me C major scale again or uh, watch out for finger four on that F sharp. Remember you missed it, send it to me again. Little things like that. And of course, I understand for those that have so many students to teach, this is not something you want to add on your plate. You already have a lot. Um, but I think if you can really persuade your students to get an ethernet cable and you have one too, then that will you know, really kind of cut down on some of the extra time that you have to spend on doing the necessary videos. If you want to do extra stuff, for them, um, then that's great. But I don't know that it will be necessary if you do manage to get that going. Um, the Ethernet cord also, you can just buy it online or at a shop for pretty, not that expensive, is that right? Yes, so the one uh, that I got, which is 100 feet, it was for about $25. And there's lower ones, uh, I mean, uh, shorter ones that have lower prices for sure. Okay. And um, I think you want to have, there's two different versions. There's one that is a CAT5 and CAT6. 
Mm -hmm. I don't understand the, you know, particular technology terminology behind it, but I know that cat six is better than five. So <laughs> that's one of the things you might want to have. And then of course, depending on what kind of computer you have, if you have a Mac, I think you may need something that is an adapter of sorts, mm -hmm. like these things right. that have, you know, entry for that. And a lot of the new computers now don't actually have um, the LAN or Ethernet cable entrances anymore, or they have one USB entry. So, you know, those little, again, extensions and gadgets that might be necessary. I had to get one for um, mine. So the third question, what does she do for waning attention? Oi, that's a sore subject <laughs> for everyone all the time, right? It's not just now, but now it's more challenging. So uh, different, different when you have them in person, you know, you can not physically shake them, but you know, you can really like with your energy or whatever it is you're making them do, uh, kind of get their attention a little bit more. With the little ones, I literally sometimes say, okay, then jumping jacks, go. Just because they need to get some of that energy out or actually wake up, depending on the case. <laughs> it works in both, both realms, <laughs> whether you want them to calm down or you want them to be energized a little bit. Um, but as far as the lessons, I have a few students that are young that normally they would be able to handle a one hour lesson. One of the things that we decided to do with their parents was to then split that into meeting twice for half an hour during the week. And um, I think that was one of the best decisions for them. And I think, if, you know, once we return to live in-person lessons, they should probably continue still with that because for that young of an age, I think it actually really made a difference in their ability to just grasp material and then to practice it for two, three days, come back, review it, move on to something new. Um, so that really helped. As far as, you know, your regular students, regular meaning older, who are normally doing an hour or 45 minutes, I always try to mix things up. Um, if we're doing a little bit of technique at first, then we move on to some repertoire, take a little break, do some theory. Uh, there's this feature on Zoom. I don't know if anybody uses it or if you're familiar with it, whiteboard, which is quite cool. It's basically just like the regular sharing button. So it allows you to draw things. You can do little rhythm exercises with them. Um, you can play something, let's say if you want to do rhythm practice, and you can ask them to draw on it too. So you can give them drawing permission and they can do that at the same time. Um, so it's well, like, Zoom, right? It's like, it's, it's not an extra app. It's already, already built in. Already there. So it's basically uh, at the bottom, you are on a computer. It's at the bottom of your toolbar. It's the share button. And then once you click on the share, it gives you a few options. So you can choose whether you want to share your screen, your whiteboard or a secondary device or anything like that. So it's right there. It has different colors. One of the things that I found super useful, uh, actually, because I didn't want to do the whole thing of connecting my iPad and then using a, uh, a manuscript paper from there. So on that whiteboard app, what you can do is that it has a straight line option. So you can draw your staff if you have the, you know, time for it and if you can like, quickly do it. Um, and it also has these circles that come you know, empty and come filled, which is great because then you don't need to draw the notes in like a you know, crooked looking way. <laughs> it makes them look super neat and like they were basically taken from a book. So <laughs> that's awesome. I didn't know that. I did not know about that option at all. Um, and it's Very something cool. that you kind of used and adapted to music teaching. You know, it's not like, oh, uh, draw a staff, but you, you were able to do that. So I'm, I... Yeah, and this came just as an experimentation, actually. It was with one of the younger students because uh, the thing with this younger student is that differently from most of the other ones that I have who are uh, learning with ABCDFG, he does Dori Mi Fa Do. So then any kind of app that is a good note naming app or anything like that doesn't quite work for him. Mm. So I have to, you know build things or create uh, games or create, um, you know, little exercises. Um, there's also another site called Kahoot that I learned from a colleague from the summer camp, actually, this past summer, uh, that you can create different kinds of quizzes or assignments, little things like that that they can access online. Um, so for him, for example, I have to do that because I, the answers needs to be <laughs> with Dorin Pasolati Dov. So... Um, that's how I found out about this. It was really, oh, wow, you got so much worse at doing this. Okay, let's see, what can we do? <laughs> that's so, I'm sure that's also very useful for teachers who are teaching, you know, composition or doing some um, 
improv improvisations and that's something also hard to do on zoom too so this kind of uh, using that resource would be very useful just straight out from zoom right yes and if you have uh, another device i think you can do that through the phone too but for example uh, on the the ipad i use uh, fourscore for the music in general for reading um and you know if you can download a manuscript kind of thing i can show you in a little bit um let's do this um I'm gonna to have to join the meeting from another um, from another account, but it really helps because then you can really have the visual aid for the student. Then they don't feel like you're just talking to them and uh, saying, "Okay, what is the note on the third line?" And then they have to imagine it. So you're really um, playing to that visual impact right away, which again I think it makes a huge difference, especially if they're young. It really yeah, helps. It goes back to like adding different stimulus too at the same time. When you have, when you're listening to your instructions and then also have a visual like cue in front of you, um, definitely helps. I use screen sharing a lot so I can share my scores. Um, I guess that's something similar to what you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. So actually, um, what I'm trying to use here, here we go. So if you share, for example, like you said, screen sharing, but then you want to use something for them to do note naming or anything like that, or if you're trying to explain a notation of sorts, you can always use, let's say your four score mm. and then just start drawing. Oh. The, white, the whiteboard feature, could mm -hmm. you show on your end while you're at it? That'd be great. If I can do it from here, I should be able to, there we go. So here is the whiteboard. I don't know if on the iPad it has all the line features that I was talking about. It should, but I just never tried it here. So, so I don't see this on I don't see the straight line option on the iPad. That's good to know. So if and I don't see the note option either. But I can show you on the um, computer option. Computer. Yeah, that's another thing too that kind of was a little bit stressful because some people it's not unified on what kind of devices we're using like there's right. difference between ipad and then a computer it's not really updated the same way mm -hmm. so. that's true yes no see it doesn't have it i was trying to find the, the the option that i was saying that is really great the straight line but it doesn't have it mm -hmm. so it seems to me that actually the only thing here is if you are sharing from uh, another kind of application or uh, just the score, like you're saying, if you want to show them the score and mark things based on that. Okay. Yeah, so if um, you're, if you're uh, connecting via iPad or phone, you can do the four score sharing. But if you're, you know, from the computer, we can try that. Or mm -hmm. think the teachers can do the whiteboard with the pre, pre straight line things. Yes, yes. And that is quite useful. I mean, you know, it's not the most uh, convenient because you still have to draw the line, right, compared to having it already there. But uh, I do think it's a good in-between step. You know, if you don't want to write a lot and if it's just, to, you know, to short little examples, that helps. Um, so that was for the third question. And one of the things uh, to add to that, one of the things that um, I also found very helpful was actually to just make the student talk to you about the piece, you know, because I think a lot of the time the whole instruction, instruction, they are receiving, receiving, receiving. So sometimes they may tune out, uh, but the moment that you put them on the hot seat, you know, and you're making them tell you things, then they really have to snap out of it. <laughs> and that's part of the, the, the testing, you know, that could go into the lesson um, to see whether it's just, okay, so why don't you tell me what you think about this piece? Or why don't you tell me what happened in that second measure there? How about you explain that rhythm to me? Things like this that I think by putting them in the little teacher's chair, then they will actually, uh, yeah, be a little bit more aware of what's going on. Definitely, that's that's so important. I feel like it's important in real person, but so much more so over the screen. Right, right. Everything becomes more of, a, of an issue, right? So we have to find ways around it. Um, to the fourth question of recommendations on how to better record at home. Um, in that last document, again, you have a bunch of resources there, but one of the things that I found very useful uh, as far as audio recording goes without having to spend money on an extra device is, so Zoom, actually, I'll show you the this here. Zoom is in the recording device, Zoom. 
uh, has also an app which is called Handy's, Handy Zoom. And it looks completely like Zoom itself. So it allows you to do all the, the edits that you want to do and it allows you to modify the levels of the sound that you're inputting into the recording. So it doesn't sound like the plain voice memo sort of uh, audio that you would get from your phone. And this can be also on the phone or iPad or whatever other kind of device you have. Um, so that I find super helpful and very, very useful. And then as far as video recording, I think the whole stand issue and the camera from the phone, I think that kind of solves it. Because if you're trying to send something to the student where uh, you just need a better angle for them to see, then if you have the, a proper stand for it, it, it is basically taken care of. Um, I think the only difference would be if you're trying to, and I don't know how the extent of the question, if you're trying to do recordings just for yourself, then that's a different story, I guess. Depends how professional you want them to be or how much more information you want in there. If it's just you playing and that's it, or if there's a talking part, if there's a visual part, um, I have played around a little bit with this other app, which again is included there called Kine Master. Kine is in K-I-N-E Master. Very uh, user friendly and quite easy to, to manage. So again, depending on how fancy things need to look like, it can be as simple as just recording with your phone. And then if it's you know for a proper, um, better quality recording than just having an external, like an actual recording device. Um, one of the most convenient ones, I think, is the Zoom H4n that either comes with its microphones or then you can buy the external microphones for that, that you can connect. Um, again, depending on how far you want to go with it. There's so many options out there. So it so can kind of feel overwhelming. Um, but I think, I guess the first step to that is to kind of assess what do you need it for if right you record you know recording small clips to show your teacher of how you practice you probably wouldn't need those professional level microphone you just have to kind of make sure i mean one of the things that oops is that you know mike is here so you wouldn't like put it this way or down kind of do it landscape way so that the mic kind of catch you better those are like yes. the ways I, I learned from my experience. Um, but like, like you said, if you want to, for example, if people want to submit for Motivation Monday and want to look at for a little bit better, you know, better angle, then it might be worth it to try out these um, amazing apps that you just showed us for the Zoom or something, just to kind of level, make sure the balance is right. And then again, it's, it takes a little bit of time to figure it out, but it's also a knowledge that's not going to go away. <laughs> you'll learn it and be able to use it. Um, and so many things are all online. I mean, mm -hmm. college applications are all online. You know? My students who are going to be applying for conservatories, preliminary and final auditions are all online. So it's a really good, um, good time to figure it out now, I think. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, and then as far as the um, kind of setup and all of that, what you said actually is very, very important because um, what happens a lot of the time is that if the mic is down so that it's getting the, the little vibration that comes out of the instrument itself in the room um, and also the whole landscape aspect, I think it's much better to go that way than whoever is watching it or if they need to modify things and they can crop accordingly. But if you have the uh, portrait version, the vertical one, it's really hard to manage that. It tends to be very, uh, you know, I don't know, not, not very appealing <laughs> the way that it looks like. So um, as far as the, the whole, let's say if you do audio and video separately, because that kind of will assure a better um, audio uh, quality. You'd be surprised how many of these kids are actually so well versed in anything technological. So even if they don't know exactly what they what program they need to use, they will probably figure it out in I don't know fifty percent of the time or less that it would, that it would take us or anybody else. So uh, sometimes it's nice to even just give them that homework, you know, to say record this and that, merge them together. I'd love to see it next time, you know, anything like that. And I found that especially in the summer when they had less things to do. Uh, they didn't have all the camps that they normally go to that were in person. So it was more free time, whatever was free for them. Um, and we all knew that too. So it was a nice thing to kind of push on them. 
<laughs> to say, I know you're not doing anything else. Why don't you try this? Oh, hello. <laughs> Someone woke up from his nap. Now we have an audience. <laughs> oh, this is so much better. <laughs> I love you, Yerin, but this is so much better. <laughs> Oh, it is what it is. <laughs> sure, some teachers have this too all the time when they're working from home. But um, it looks very yeah. well rested, though. The nap was good, I think. <laughs> uh, well, we're down to the last question. Yes. I know I kept you a long time, and it just okay. it's just like full of amazing information. So I could talk for hours more. But I love talking, so we're good. <laughs> So yes, the last one, how can we balance big goals versus small goals to keep the students motivated? Um, a little bit similar to what we were saying earlier about giving them these, let's say a recording project or something like that. Um, one of the main issues that happened with the pandemic is that then we didn't have our usual uh, spring recitals or anything that we normally would do. So <clears throat> that kind of made these uh, goals uh, I don't know, disappear, evaporate into the air or take different kinds of shapes. So even doing the, the mini studio classes kind of thing for anybody that has uh, large studios, maybe you want to do, I don't know, one every month or something like that, just to keep the students motivated to play in front of each other, because that keeps them um, kind of uh, on, on, the, on their, um, on their you, well, you're on their case by doing that. So you're telling them, look, you know, you're going to play in the studio and then you want to show everybody how much you've worked on this. Let's share it with everyone. Um, so that is kind of like a small goal in a way because it's not high pressure. They don't have to audition for anything. They're just sharing what they've done in the past two, three weeks. Um, that's uh, in a way what happened also with our Kaleidoscope News Art uh, Motivation Monday and how, why it came about basically. But um, as far as long, uh, big goals, I think there's a lot of competitions now that have gone online. So it's worth looking into that and some of those guidelines and repertoire selections that maybe they were more extensive before they've kind of streamlined them a little bit. So maybe that opens up the possibility for more students also to participate. Um, I know a colleague of ours also a part of Kaleidoscope Music Arts team. He has a competition called stay at home competition and I can send that to you here after. Uh, I did not include that here yet because I had uh, forgotten that they started a new um, set of that, which is for students under 18. So they did the one with the professionals over 18, so now there's one for the younger students. So um, if the deadline is still open, I think it's a great thing to do to try and, and, and audition for that. But yeah, small goals, it might, like I said earlier, it might also just be a check-in in the middle of the week and ask them to send you a video recording of their playing. Um, you may not even have time to look at it until the day of the, the lesson, but just the fact that you made them do something before their lesson time makes them actually be prepared earlier and have little goals to uh, aim for, which I think are very, very useful as well. That's really, uh, I think, an important, one of the most important things is kind of keeping them in check by these small goals. I mean, it adds as like a social thing too, if you are able to kind of say, okay, the students will, will get into a mini studio class, you know, in the middle of the week, after school, whatever, no pressure, very relaxed thing. And you could even put them in breakout rooms um, mm -hmm. and then have them talk about what they did and how they practiced and sending the teachers little snippets of their recordings of, of practicing. That all adds up and can actually go towards the big goal of making a more professional video to enter a competition. So it's, I think a lot of it is this kind of overwhelming task when you say, oh, you should apply for a internet competition. A lot of times students are like, well, where do we start? But then if you've been doing this throughout the semester, kind of practicing recording, submitting it to teachers, doing things online, it, it's not that big of a deal when you have to make a, a long one, for example. So I think that's really... Yes one of the most useful things you can do to the studio, like everything you said, you know, small goals of submitting things, you know, s small get togethers. Um, so I think students need that too. One of the things that was really wonderful to see at my chamber festival was even if they weren't playing, we kind of, at the end of the day, it was a short one. It was only five days, but we got together and kind of chat, you know, and we, we had a lecture. So we, even just seeing everybody's faces on the screen kind of made you feel, feel like you're in this together. Um, seeing your face with somebody else's, like right now, I see myself 
and Adrian with you, <laughs> I feel like we're hanging out. And I think that kind of goes back to what you were saying about positive mindset, because it does something actually to you. You feel like you are still connected with real people. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, and I think that we need to embrace that too, right? One of the things I noticed too is I finally started, you know, talking and chatting with some people that um, I haven't in years that live in a different continent. But that is because now this is the whole idea of a physical uh, presence is not really uh, a hindrance anymore. We all know that there's no way around it. So then this becomes the norm and this becomes okay to do. So yeah, big difference for sure to, to do those little goal uh, expectations every time. Actually, you mentioned the, the camp. For me, one of the things that was really uh, exciting to watch in the summer camp at the University of Miami, um, one of the things that I normally teach every year is chamber music, but we didn't do that this year. But we did stick with our duet ensembles. So I was really happy to see how all the pianists, you know, from age 10, 11 to 17, they managed to play their parts, uh, record alongside somebody else, and then, you know, put that performance together. So the reason why I put here uh, down the list, you'll see solo a la duetto, is because one of the students actually learned both parts, and he recorded his own playing of both parts, and then put them together, and he did the merging himself, too. So that's why I was saying also that you'd be surprised sometimes how young students are really well-versed in these kind of uh, technological adventures. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and he had so much fun doing that as well. And, you know, you, you, he enjoyed the process. It's like you create this little thing for yourself. I think the whole idea that you're, you're um, doing it from scratch, it's right. a new version of a scrapbook. I don't know. <laughs> you're also, doing it. Yeah, you also end up with an actual product at the end mm -hmm. of it. You know, sure, I miss, I miss performing live more than anything in the entire world. Um, but every performance now I do is recorded or it's, it's pre-recorded or it's live, whatever it is, there's an actual product that you can always go back to. And for young students, I think it's also important because that kind of, it's like a trophy. It's like, oh, this is what I worked on this summer when the whole world went online. I, I worked hard on this thing. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's the, the flip side of this whole thing. Yes, definitely. Um, one of the other things that, I, like you said, the recording, the idea that they have something to prove, you know, to the show for the work that they've put into it. And also, as far as recordings, one of the main things that I think has been a huge benefit, especially for the students that are, uh, you know, already progressing a certain path, right? They're not just doing the weekly lessons because they want to pass their time, which is great if they want to. But uh, if their goal is to really go someplace, um, I found that because they're now finally listening, and finally see what you hear and what you see, that there's a, a much more um, impactful change that is happening in their playing because they're being more self con well, not self-conscious, but more conscientious of their choices. Um, and the fact that they have that outside ear now that they keep you know, trying to, to train um, and they become more... <laughs> um, one of the things that I also think is a lot of fun to do, and if they really, you know, latch onto that, that's great, is doing the sh short, short research projects. For example, I have a student who recently, for the first time, is playing a ballad. So when I asked him what is a ballad, then he did not know, and unsurprisingly so, he's very young. So um, his whole project for the week was to look up what the ballad means, where does it come from, what it means in literature, what kind of... Uh, ballads that we have in music and what are some ballads that composers have written and it was so sweet and it made me smile so much when I received the video from him uh, you know so diligently having worked on it and it didn't matter that he was reading from the screen but he really put in the work um, to, to learn more about this so I think that's great it's it and it, you're making a well-rounded musician by doing that you're not just you know trying to get through the piece of music you're making them think in broader terms uh, which is I think one of the biggest things we can ask of our students is to be really um, as open-minded and as uh, well-rounded as they can possibly be. That's, that's really awesome. I mean, it kind of directly relates to what they will be doing at school too. You're, you know, like what you said with well-rounded, it's, it's, you're developing skill sets beyond musicianship. Um, that doesn't take away from musicianship, but it kind of enhances both worlds. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so let me show you really quickly the drive link just so that you can see. Um, 
oh, my computer is telling me my battery is about to die. <laughs> Again, technology is evil. <laughs> so right here, you have the PDF with the online resources. So for everyone that is interested in looking into any of these, you have the links. That's where it will send you directly to. And then these are the options for the microphones, the one, two, three, four, five. They're kind of escalating in price <laughs> if you go to the five. <laughs> Um, one thing that I did not mention actually, but it's uh, proven so far to be extremely useful to enhance audio quality in Zoom is this right here, Clean Feed. It's not an app. You don't have to download anything. Uh, you just need to have Google Chrome as a browser or as one of your browsers and access that from there. So I've put the direct link to this one. It's very straightforward. All you need to do is have an account and it doesn't cost anything. You just need to then connect through that and it makes the sound quality of Zoom a hundred times better uh, for music making especially. But I've also included down here uh, version 3, those high fidelity uh, features that we were just talking about together. Um, again, I have not tried this yet. So hopefully it's good. If it's good, then we don't have to use all the external stuff. This is then so useful and informative. Thank you so much. Put it together. I mean, I think the teachers and students and, you know, people listening will, this is like, this is like gold because <laughs> everybody's scrambling because that's another thing. There's just so much resources out there. It's hard to even look what's suitable for music teaching, you know, because there's just so much. So this is kind of already, you've done it. You've, we went through a trial and error. So it's, it's kind of, giving everybody a shortcut of what works best. Um, so this will be very useful and I'm sure everybody will really appreciate that. I really hope it, it helps. And I mean, this was actually good for me too to do, so thank you. <laughs> because I had all these things scattered all over the place and now I have to put them all in one document. So I know where to find it now myself too. <laughs> That's awesome. So I'll share that document with everybody too, um, with, awesome. with, the, with the PowerPoint that you so amazingly created for us. Um, but yeah, wow, thanks so much. And, you know, that was informative, but that was also really fun just to kind of <laughs> talk about all the things. And, you know, it was just so amazing to connect with you. Same yeah, for me, yes. Yeah. You would have connected and said hi anyways, but then just kind of <laughs> made it even more immediate for me to reach out and say, you know, we can use your help. <laughs> so it's Thank you. Thank you for reaching out. This was really special. So yeah. <laughs> it's nice to we don't, it's just day by day, right? It's just hard to know what's going to happen next term, mm -hmm. next semester, next year. So I think it's just important to keep this positivity going. Oh, and for, for those of you who are listening, Dr. Gagrifty is an amazing Zumba dancer too. <laughs> She's pretty awesome. Not so gonna go on my resume anytime soon. So it's <laughs> don't you have an Instagram thing that you can people can kind of follow and dance and exercise too. Well, I can't put those on Instagram, but they can join the class if they want to. Yeah. On Instagram, you have the you have my uh, link to the the instructor's page where you can then find all the classes. <laughs> I'm gonna add that onto the research. <laughs> But yeah, I guess it's of, of, my, of my routine now, yes. I think it's part of what has helped me stay sane during this time. So that's why I said find whatever works for you. That's so much healthier than my routine. I'm like, mine is to just cook and eat. Oh, I do that too. But you see, I don't have two children to take care of yet. So I cook and eat and then I dance. And then dance. That's awesome. That's, that's really inspiring. Um, so thank you so much, Inessa. Thanks so much thank you. for your time and knowledge and spending time with all of us. Um, and best of luck this semester to you and to, to you too. Yes, to you too and everybody else watching. Uh, keep this up. Yeah, everybody, the world needs you. So yes. just know that. And it's really important to just keep this up. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. I'll Bye. <laughs>